Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing by Judy Bloom. Chapter 1 The Big Winner. I won Dribble at Jimmy Fargo's birthday party. All the other guests got to take home goldfish in little plastic bags. I won him because I guessed there were 348 jelly beans in Mrs. Fargo's jar. Really, there were 423, she told us later. Still, my guess was closest. Peter Warren Hatcher is the big winner, Mrs. Fargo announced. At first, I felt bad that I didn't get a goldfish, too. Then, Jimmy handed me a glass bowl. Inside, there was some water and three rocks. A tiny green turtle was sleeping on the biggest rock. All the other guys looked at their goldfish. I knew what they were thinking. They wished they could have tiny green turtles, too. I named my turtle Dribble while I was walking home from Jimmy's party. I live at 25 West 68th Street. It's an old apartment building, but it's got one of the best elevators in New York City. There are mirrors all around. You can see yourself from every angle. There's a soft, cushioned bench to sit on if you're too tired to stand. The elevator operator's name is Henry Bevelheimer. He lets us call him Henry because Bevelheimer's very hard to say. Our apartment's on the 12th floor. But I don't have to tell Henry. He already knows. He knows everybody in the building. He's that smart. He even knows I'm nine and in the fourth grade. I showed him dribble right away. I want him at a birthday party, I said. Henry smiled. Your mother's going to be surprised. Henry was bright. My mother was really surprised. Her mouth opened when I said, Just look what I want at Jimmy Fargo's birthday party. I held up my tiny green turtle. I've already named him Dribble. Isn't that a great name for a turtle? My mother made a face. I don't like the way he smells, she said. What do you mean? I asked. I put my nose right down close to him. I didn't smell anything but turtle. So, Dribble smells like turtle, I thought. Well, he's supposed to. That's what he is. And I'm not going to take care of him either, my mother added. Of course you're not, I told her. He's my turtle. And I'm the one who's going to take care of him. You're going to change his water and clean out his bowl and feed him and all of that, she asked. Yes, I said, and even more. I'm going to see to it that he's happy. This time, my mother made a funny noise, like a groan. I went into my bedroom. I put Dribble on top of my dresser. I tried to pet him and tell him he would be happy living with me. But it isn't easy to pet a turtle. They aren't soft and furry, and they don't lick you or anything. Still, I had my very own pet at last. Later, when I sat down at the dinner table, my mother said, I smell turtle. Peter, go and scrub your hands. Some people might think that my mother is my biggest problem. She doesn't like turtles, and she's always telling me to scrub my hands. That doesn't mean just run them under the water. Scrub means I'm supposed to use soap and rub my hands together. Then I've got to rinse and dry them. I ought to know by now. I've heard it enough. But my mother isn't my biggest problem. Neither is my father. He spends a lot of time watching commercials on TV. That's because he's in the advertising business. These days, his favorite commercial is the one about Juicio. He wrote it himself. And the president of Juicio Company liked it so much, he sent my father a whole crate of Juicio for our family to drink. It tastes like a combination of oranges, pineapples, grapefruits, pears, and bananas. And if you want to know the truth, I'm getting pretty sick of drinking it. But Juicio isn't my biggest problem either. My biggest problem is my brother, 
Farley Drexel Hatcher. He's two and a half years old. Everybody calls him Fudge. I feel sorry for him if he's going to grow up with a name like Fudge, but I don't say a word. It's none of my business. Fudge is always in my way. He messes up everything he sees, and when he gets mad, he throws himself flat on the floor and he screams, and he kicks, and he bangs his fists. The only time I really like him is when he's sleeping. He sucks four fingers on his left hand and makes a slurping noise. When Fudge saw Dribble, he said, Oh, see, and I said, that's my turtle, get it? Mine. You don't touch him. Fudge said, no touch. Then he laughed like crazy. Chapter 2. Mr. and Mrs. Juicio. One night, my father came home from the office all excited. He told us Mr. and Mrs. Yarby were coming to New York. He's the president of the Juicio Company. He lives in Chicago. I wondered if he'd bring my father another crate of Juicio. If he did, I'd probably be drinking it for the rest of my life. Just thinking about it was enough to make my stomach hurt. My father said he invited Mr. and Mrs. Yarby to stay with us. My mother wanted to know why they couldn't stay at a hotel like most people who come to New York. My father said they could, but he didn't want them to. He thought they'd be more comfortable staying with us. My mother said that was about the silliest thing she'd ever heard. But she fixed up Fudge's bedroom for our guests. She put fancy sheets and a brand new blanket on the hide bed That's a sofa that opens up into a bed at night. It's in Fudge's room because that used to be our den. Before he was born, we watched TV in there. And lots of times, Grandma slept over on the hide bed Now we watch TV right in the living room, and Grandma doesn't sleep over very often. My mother moved Fudge's crib into my room. He's going to get a regular bed when he's there, my mother says. There are a lot of reasons I don't like to sleep in the same room as Fudge. I found that out two months ago when my bedroom was being painted. I had to sleep in Fudge's room for three nights because the paint smell made me cough. For one thing, he talks in his sleep. And if a person didn't know better, a person could get scared. Another thing is that slurping noise he makes. It's true that I like to hear it when I'm awake, but when I'm trying to fall asleep, I like things very quiet. When I complained about having to sleep with Fudge, my mother said, It's just for two nights, Peter. I'll sleep in the living room, I suggested, on the sofa, or even a chair. No, my mother said, you will sleep in your bedroom, in your own bed. There was no point in arguing. Mom wasn't going to change her mind. She spent the day in the kitchen. She really cooked up a storm. She used so many pots and pans, Fudge didn't have any left to bang together. And that's one of his favorite pastimes, banging pots and pans together. A person can get an awful headache listening to that racket. Right after lunch, my mother opened up the dinner table. We don't have a separate dining room. When we have company for dinner, we eat in one end of the living room. When Mom finished setting the table, she put a silver bowl filled with flowers right in the middle. I said, Hey, Mom, it looks like you're expecting the president or something. Very funny, Peter, my mother answered. Sometimes my mother laughs like crazy at my jokes. Other times she pretends not to get them. And then there are times when I know she gets them, but she doesn't seem to like them. This was one of those times. So I decided no more jokes until after dinner. I went to Jimmy Fargo's for the afternoon. I came home at four o'clock. I found my mother standing over the dinner table mumbling. Fudge was on the floor playing with my father's socks. I'm not sure why he likes socks so much, but if you give him a few pairs, he'll play quietly for an hour. I said, Hi, Mom, I'm home. I'm missing two flowers, my mother said. I don't know how she noticed that two flowers were missing from her silver bowl, because there were at least a dozen of them.
but sure enough, when I checked, I saw two stems with nothing on them. Don't look at me, Mom, I said. What would I do with two measly flowers? So we both looked at Fudge. Did you take Mommy's pretty flowers? My mother asked him. No take, Fudge said. He was chewing on something. What's in your mouth? My mother asked. Fudge didn't answer. Show Mommy. No show, Fudge said. Oh, yes, my mother picked him up and forced his mouth open. She fished out a rose petal. What did you do with Mommy's flowers? She raised her voice. She was really getting upset. Fudge laughed. Tell Mommy. Yum, Fudge said. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Oh, no, my mother cried, rushing to the telephone. She called Dr. Cone. She told him that Fudge ate two flowers. Dr. Cohn must have asked what kind, because my mother said, Roses, I think, but I can't be sure. One might have been a daisy. There was a long pause while my mother listened to whatever Dr. Cohn had to say. Then Mom said, Thank you, Dr. Cohn. She hung up. No more flowers, she told Fudge. You understand? No more, Fudge repeated. No more. No more, no more. My mother gave him a spoonful of peppermint-flavored medicine, the kind I take when I have stomach pains. Then she carried Fudge off to have his bath. Leave it to my brother to eat flowers. I wondered how they tasted. Maybe they're delicious, and I don't know it because I've never tasted one, I thought. I decided to find out. I picked off one petal from a pink rose. I put it in my mouth and tried to chew it up. But I couldn't do it. It tasted awful. I spit it out in the garbage. Well, at least now I knew I wasn't missing anything great. Fudge ate his supper in the kitchen before our company arrived. While he was eating, I heard my mother remind him. Fudge is going to be a good boy tonight. Very good for Daddy's friends. Good, Fudge said. Good boy. That's right, my mother told him. I changed and scrubbed up while Fudge finished his supper. I was going to eat with the company. Being nine has its advantages. My mother was all dressed up by the time my father got home with the Yerbys. You'd never have guessed that Mom spent most of the day in the kitchen. You'd also never have guessed that Fudge ate two flowers. He was feeling fine. He even smelled nice, like baby powder. Mrs. Yerby picked him up right away. I knew she would. She looked like a grandmother. That type always makes a big deal out of fudge. She walked into the living room cuddling him. Then she sat down on the sofa and bounced fudge around on her lap. Isn't he the cutest little boy, Mrs. Yarby said. I just love babies. She gave him a big kiss on the top of his head. I kept waiting for somebody to tell her fudge was no baby, but no one did. My father carried the Yerby suitcases into Fudge's room. When he came back, he introduced me to our company. This is our older son, Peter, he said to the Yarbys. I'm nine and in fourth grade, I told them. How do, Peter, Mr. Yerby said. Mrs. Yarby just gave me a nod. She was still busy with Fudge. I have a surprise for this dear little boy, she said. It's in my suitcase. Should I go get it? Yes, Fudge shouted. Go get, go get. Mrs. Yarby laughed, as if that was the best joke she ever heard. I'll be right back, she told Fudge. She put him down and ran off to find her suitcase. She came back carrying a present tied up with a red ribbon. Oh, Fudge cried, opening his eyes wide. Goody, he clapped his hands. Mrs. Yarby helped him unwrap his surprise. It was a wind-up train that made a lot of noises. Every time it bumped into something, it turned around and went the other way. Fudge liked it a lot. He likes anything that's noisy. I said, that's a nice train. Mrs. Yarby turned to me. Oh, I have something for you, too. Uh, uh, Peter, I reminded her. My name is Peter. 
Yes, well, I'll go get it. Mrs. Yarby left the room again. This time she came back with a flat package. It was wrapped up too, red ribbon and all. She handed it to me. Fudge stopped playing with his train, long enough to come over and see what I got. I took off the paper very carefully in case my mother wanted to save it, and also to show Mrs. Yarby that I'm a lot more careful about things than my brother. I'm not sure she noticed. My present turned out to be a big picture dictionary, the kind I liked when I was about four years old. My old one is in Fudge's bookcase now. I don't know much about big boys, Mrs. Yarby said, so the lady in the store said a nice book would be a good idea. A nice book would have been a good idea, I thought, but a picture dictionary? That's for babies. I've had my own regular dictionary since I was eight, but I knew I had to be polite, so I said, Thank you very much. It's just what I've always wanted. I'm so glad, Mrs. Yarby said. She let out a long sigh and sat back on the sofa. My father offered the Yarbys a drink. Good idea, good idea, Mr. Yarby said. What'll it be, my father asked. "'What'll it be?' Mr. Yarby repeated, laughing. "'What do you think, Hatcher? "'It'll be juicio. That's all we ever drink. "'Good for your health,' Mr. Yarby pounded his chest. "'Of course,' my father said, like he knew it all along. "'Juicio for everyone.' "'My father told my mother. "'She went into the kitchen to get it. "'While my father and Mr. Yarby were discussing juicio, "'Fudge disappeared.' Just as my mother served everyone a glass of Mr. Yarby's favorite drink, he came back. He was carrying a book, my old worn-out picture dictionary, the same as the one the Yarbys just gave me. See, Fudge said, climbing up on Mrs. Yarby's lap, see book? I wanted to vanish. I think my mother and father did too. See book? Now Fudge held it up over his head. I can use another one, I explained. I really can. That old one is falling apart, I tried to laugh. It's returnable, Mrs. Yarby said. It's silly to keep it if you already have one. She sounded insulted. Like it was my fault she brought me something I already had. Mine, Fudge said. He closed the book and held it tight against his chest. Mine, mine, mine. It's the thought that counts, my mother said. It was so nice of you to think of our boys. Then she turned to Fudge. Put the book away now, Fudgy. Isn't it Fudgy's bedtime, my father hinted. Oh, yes, I think it is, my mother said, scooping him up. Say good night, Fudgy. Good night, Fudgy, my brother said, waving at us. Fudge was supposed to fall asleep before we sat down to dinner. But just in case, my mother put a million little toys in his crib to keep him busy. I don't know who my mother thought she was fooling, because we all know that Fudge can climb out of his crib any old time he wants to. He stayed away until we were in the middle of our roast beef. Then he came in carrying Dribble's bowl. He walked right up to Mrs. Yarby. He thought she was his new friend. See, he said, holding Dribble under her nose. See, Dribble. Mrs. Yarby shrieked. Oh, I can't stand reptiles. Get that thing away from me. Fudge looked disappointed, so he showed Dribble to Mr. Yarby. See, he said. Hatcher, Mr. Yarby boomed. Make him get that thing out of here. I wondered why Mr. Yarby called my father Hatcher. Didn't he know his first name was Warren? And I didn't like the way Mr. and Mrs. Yarby both called Dribble a thing. I jumped up. Give it to me, I told Fudge. I took Dribble and his bowl and marched into my room. I inspected my turtle all over. He seemed all right. I didn't want to make a big scene in front of our company, but I was mad. I mean really mad. That kid knows he's not allowed to touch my turtle. Peter, my father called, come and finish your dinner. When I got back to the table, I heard Mrs. Yarby say, It must be interesting to have children. 
we never had any ourselves. But if we did, Mr. Yarby told my father, we teach them some manners. I'm a firm believer in old-fashioned good manners. So are we, Howard, my father said in a weak voice. I thought Mr. Yarby had a lot of nerve to hint that we had no manners. Didn't I pretend to like their dumb old picture dictionary? If that isn't good manners, then I don't know what is. My mother excused herself and carried Fudge back to my room. I guess she put him into his crib again. I hoped she told him to keep his hands off my things. We didn't hear from him again until dessert. Just as my mother was pouring the coffee, he ran in wearing my rubber gorilla mask from last Halloween. It's a very real-looking mask. I guess that's why Mrs. Yarby screamed so loud. If she hadn't made so much noise, my mother probably wouldn't have spilled the coffee all over the floor. My father grabbed Fudge and pulled the gorilla mask off him. That's not funny, Fudge, he said. Funny, Fudge laughed. Funny, 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 fudgy. Yes, sir, Hatcher, Mr. Yarby said, old-fashioned manners. By that time, I'm sure my father was sorry the Yarbys weren't staying at a hotel. I finally got to bed at ten. Fudge was in his crib, slurping away. I thought I'd never fall asleep, but I guess I did. I woke up once when Fudge started blabbing. He said, Boo ba mum mum ha ba she. Whatever that means. I didn't even get scared. I whispered, Shut up. And he did. Early the next morning, I felt something funny on my arm. At first I didn't wake up. I just felt this little tickle. I thought it was part of my dream, but then I had the feeling somebody was staring at me, so I opened my eyes. Fudge was standing over me, and Dribble was crawling around on my arm. I guess Fudge could tell I was about ready to kill him, because he bent down and kissed me. That's what he does when my mother's angry at him. He thinks nobody can resist him when he makes himself so lovable. And a lot of times it works with my mother, but not with me. I jumped up, put Dribble back into his bowl, and smacked Fudge on the backside. Hard. He hollered. My father came running into my room. He was still in his pajamas. He whispered, What's going on in here? I pointed at Fudge, and he pointed at me. My father picked up my brother and carried him off. Go back to sleep, Peter, he said. It's only six o'clock in the morning. I fell asleep for another hour, then woke up to an awful noise. It was Fudge playing with his new train. It woke up everybody, including the Yarbys, but this time there was nobody they could blame. They were the ones who gave Fudge the train in the first place. Breakfast was a very quiet affair. Nobody had much to say. Mr. Yarby drank two glasses of Juicio. Then he told my father that he and Mrs. Yarby had their suitcases packed. They were leaving for a hotel as soon as breakfast was over. My father said he understood that the apartment was too small for so many people. My mother didn't say anything. When Mr. Yarby went into Fudge's bedroom to pick up his suitcase, his voice boomed. Thatcher! My father ran towards the bedroom. My mother and Mrs. Yarby followed him. I followed them. When we got there, we saw Fudge sitting on the Yarby suitcase. He had decorated it with about one hundred green stamps, the kind my mother gets at the supermarket. See, Fudge said, see, pretty! He laughed. Nobody else did. Then he licked the last green stamp and stuck it right in the middle of the suitcase. All gone, Fudge sang, holding up his hands. It took my mother half an hour to peel off her trading stamps and clean up the Yarby suitcase. The next week my father came home from the office and collected all the cans of Juicio in our house. He dumped them into the garbage. My mother felt bad that my father had lost such an important account, but my father told her not to worry. Juicio wasn't selling very well at the stores, 
Nobody seemed to like the combination of oranges, grapefruits, pineapples, pears, and bananas. You know, Dad, I said, I only drank Juicio to be polite. I really hated it. You know something funny, Peter, my father said. I thought it was pretty bad myself. Chapter 3 The Family Dog Nobody ever came right out and said that Fudge was the reason my father lost the Juicio account, but I thought about it. My father said he was glad to be rid of Mr. Yarby. Now he could spend more time on his other clients, like the Toddle Bike Company. My father is in charge of their new TV commercial. I thought maybe he could use me in it since I know how to stand on my head, but he said he wasn't planning on having any headstanders in the commercial. My grandma taught me to stand on my head when I spent the night at her house. I can stay up for as long as three minutes. I showed my mother, my father, and Fudge how I could do it right in the living room. They were all impressed, especially Fudge. He wanted to do it too, so I turned him upside down and tried to teach him. But he always tumbled over backwards. Right after I learned to stand on my head, Fudge stopped eating. He did it suddenly. One day he ate fine, and the next day nothing. No eat, he told my mother. She didn't pay too much attention to him until the third day. When he still refused to eat, she got upset. You've got to eat, Fudgy, she said. You want to grow up and be big and strong, don't you? No grow, Fudge said. That night my mother told my father how worried she was about Fudge. So my father did tricks for him while my mother stood over his chair trying to get some food into his mouth. But nothing worked not even juggling oranges. Finally, my mother got the brilliant idea of me standing on my head while she fed fudge. I wasn't very excited about standing on my head in the kitchen. The floor is awfully hard in there, but my mother begged me. She said, It's very important for fudge to eat. Please help us, Peter. So I stood on my head. When fudge saw me upside down, he clapped his hands and laughed. When he laughs, he opens his mouth. That's when my mother stuffed some baked potato into it. But the next morning, I put my foot down. No. I don't want to stand on my head in the kitchen, or anywhere else, I added. And if I don't hurry, I'll be late for school. Don't you care if your brother starves? No, I told her. Peter, what an awful thing to say. Oh, he'll eat when he gets hungry. Why don't you just leave him alone? That afternoon when I came home from school, I found my brother on the kitchen floor playing with boxes of cereal and raisins and dried apricots. My mother was begging him to eat. No, 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 Fudge shouted. He made a terrible mess, dumping everything on the floor. Please stand on your head, Peter, my mother said. It's the only way he'll eat. No, I told her. I'm not going to stand on my head any more. I went into my room and slammed the door. I played with Dribble until supper time. Nobody ever worries about me the way they worry about Fudge. If I decided not to eat, they probably never even notice. That night during dinner, Fudge hid under the kitchen table. He said, I'm a doggy. Woof, woof, woof. It was hard to eat with him under the table, pulling on my legs. I waited for my father to say something, but he didn't. Finally, my mother jumped up. I know, she said. If Fudgy's a doggy, he wants to eat on the floor, right? If you ask me, Fudge never even thought about that, but he liked the idea a lot. He barked and nodded his head, so my mother fixed his plate and put it under the table. Then she reached down and petted him like he was a real dog. My father said, aren't we carrying this a little too far? My mother didn't answer. Fudge ate two bites of his dinner. My mother was satisfied. After a week of having him eat under the table, I felt like we really did have a family dog. I thought how great it would be if we could trade Fudge for a nice cocker spaniel. That would solve all my problems. I'd walk him and feed him and play with him. He could even sleep on the edge of my bed at night. But of course that was wishful thinking. My brother is here to stay. 
and there's nothing much I can do about it. Grandma came over with a million ideas about getting Fudge to eat. She tricked him by making milkshakes in the blender. When Fudge wasn't looking, she threw in an egg. Then she told him if he drank it all up, there would be a surprise in the bottom of the glass. The first time he believed her. He finished his milkshake, but all he saw was an empty glass. There wasn't any surprise. Fudge got so mad he threw the glass down. It smashed into little pieces. After that, Grandma left. The next day, my mother dragged Fudge to Dr. Cone's office. He told her to leave him alone, that Fudge would eat when he got hungry. I reminded my mother that I told her the same thing, and for free. But I guess my mother didn't believe either one of us because she took Fudge to see three more doctors. None of them could find a thing wrong with my brother. One doctor even suggested that my mother cook Fudge his favorite foods. So that night my mother broiled lamb chops just for Fudge. The rest of us ate stew. She served him the two little lamb chops on his plate under the table. Just the smell of them was enough to make my stomach growl. I thought it was mean for my mother to make them for Fudge and not me. Fudge looked at the lamb chops for a few minutes. Then he pushed his plate away. No, he said, no chops. Fudgy, you'll starve, my mother cried. You must eat. No chops. Cornflakes, Fudge said. Want cornflakes. My mother ran to get the cereal for Fudge. You can eat the chops if you want them, Peter, she told me. I reached down and helped myself to the lamb chops. My mother handed Fudge his bowl of cereal. But he didn't eat it. He sat at my feet and looked up at me. He watched me eat his chops. Eat your cereal, my father said. No, no eat cereal, Fudge yelled. My father was really mad. His face turned bright red. He said, Fudge, you will eat that cereal or you will wear it. This was turning out to be fun after all, I thought. And the lamb chops were really tasty. I dipped the bone in some ketchup and chewed away. Fudge messed around with his cereal for a minute. Then he looked at my father and said, No eat, no eat, no eat. My father wiped his mouth with his napkin, pushed back his chair, and got up from the table. He picked up the bowl of cereal in one hand and Fudge in the other. He carried them both into the bathroom. I went along nibbling on the bone to see what was going to happen. My father stood Fudge in the tub and dumped the whole bowl of cereal right over his head. Fudge screamed. He sure can scream loud. My father motioned for me to go back to the kitchen. He joined us in a minute. We sat down and finished our dinner. Fudge kept on screaming. My mother wanted to go to him, but my father told her to stay where she was. He'd had enough of Fudge's monkey business at mealtimes. I think my mother really was relieved that my father had taken over. For once, my brother got what he deserved, and I was glad. The next day, Fudge sat at the table again, in his little red booster chair where he belongs. He ate everything my mother put in front of him. No more doggy, he told us, and for a long time after that, his favorite expression was, eat it or wear it. Chapter 4. My Brother, the Bird We live near Central Park. On nice days, I like to play there after school. I'm allowed to walk over by myself as long as I'm going to be with friends. My mother doesn't want me hanging around the park alone. For one thing, Jimmy Fargo had been mugged three times, twice for his bicycle and once for his money. Only he didn't have any to give the muggers. I've never been mugged, but sooner or later I probably will be. My father told me what to do, give the muggers whatever they want, and try not to get hit on the head. Sometimes, after you're mugged, you get to go to the police headquarters. You look at a bunch of pictures of crooks to see if you can recognize the guys that mugged you. I think it would be neat to look at all those pictures. It's not that I want to get mugged, because that could be really scary. 
It's just that Jimmy Fargo's always talking about his visit to police headquarters. My father got mugged once on the subway by two girls and a guy. They took his wallet and his briefcase. He still travels around by subways, but my mother doesn't. She sticks to buses and taxis. Both my mother and my father are always warning me never to talk to strangers in the park because a lot of dope pushers hang around there. But taking dope is even dumber than smoking, so nobody's going to hook me. We live on the west side of the park. If I want to get to the zoo and pony carts, I have to walk all the way through the east side. Sometimes my mother walks across the park with Fudge. He likes the animals a lot, especially the monkeys. He also likes the helium-filled balloons. But as soon as my mother buys him one, he lets it go. I think he likes to see it float up in the sky. My mother says that's a waste of money, and she's not going to buy him any more balloons until he promises not to let go. On Sundays, the park is closed to traffic, and you can ride your bicycle all over without worrying about being run down by some crazy driver. Even Fudge can ride. He has a little blue toddler bike, a present from my father's client, and when he's riding, he makes motorcycle noises. Vroom, 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 he yells. In the fall, the leaves turn darker and drop off the trees. Sometimes there are big leaf piles on the ground. It's fun to jump around in them. I never saw bright red, yellow, and orange leaves until the day my father took us for a drive in the country. The reason the leaves don't turn bright colors in New York is the air pollution, and that's too bad because yellow and orange and red leaves really look neat. One nice sunny afternoon, I called for Jimmy Fargo, and we went to the park. Jimmy is the only kid on my block who's in my class at school. Unless you count Shyla. And I don't. She lives in my building on the tenth floor. Henry, the elevator operator, is always making jokes about me and Shyla. He thinks we like each other. The truth is, I can't stand her. She's a real know-it-all but I've discovered that most girls are. The worst thing about Shyla is the way she's always trying to touch me. And when she does, she yells, Peter's got the cooties! Peter's got the cooties! I don't believe in cooties anymore. When I was in second grade, I used to examine myself to see if I had them. But I never found any. By fourth grade, most kids give up on cooties, but not Shyla. She's still going strong, so I have to keep a safe distance from her. My mother thinks Shyla is the greatest. She's so smart, my mother says, and some day she's going to be a real beauty. Now that's the funniest, because Shyla looks a lot like the monkeys that Fudge is so crazy about. So maybe she'll look beautiful to some ape, but never to me. Me and Jimmy have this special group of rocks where we like to play when we're in the park. We play secret agent up there. Jimmy can imitate all kinds of foreign accents, probably because his father's a part-time actor. When he's not acting, he teaches a class at City College. Today, when we got to our rocks, who should be perched up there but Shyla? She was pretending to read a book, but I think she was just waiting for me and Jimmy to find out what we do when we found her on our own personal rocks. Hey, Shyla, I said. Those are our rocks. Says who? she asked. Come on, Shyla, Jimmy said, climbing up. You know me and Peter hang out here. Too bad for you, Shyla said. Oh, Shyla, I shouted. Go and find yourself another rock. I like this one, she said, as if she owned the park. So why don't you two go find another rock? Just then, who should come tearing down the path but Fudge? My mother was right behind him, hollering, Fudgy, wait for Mommy! But when Fudge gets going, he doesn't wait for anybody. He was after some pigeons. Birdie! Here, Birdie! he called. That brother of mine loves birds, but he can't get it through his head that the birds aren't about to let him catch them. Hi, Mom, I said. My mother stopped running. Peter, am I glad to see you. I can't keep up with Fudge. Mrs. Hatcher, 
Mrs. Hatcher, Shyla called, scrambling down from our rock. I'll watch Fudge for you. I'll take very good care of him. Can I, Mrs. Hatcher? Oh, please. Shyla jumped up and down and begged some more. Jimmy gave me an elbow in the ribs. He thought that my mother would let Shyla watch Fudge, and then we'd get rid of her. We'd be free to play secret agent. But Jimmy didn't know that my mother would never trust Shyla with her dear little boy. Fudge, in the meantime, was screaming, Come back, birdies! Come back to Fudge! Then my mother did a strange thing. She checked her watch and said, You know, I do have to run back to the apartment. I forgot to turn on the oven. Do you really think you could keep an eye on Fudge for just ten minutes? Of course I can, Mrs. Hatcher, Shyla said. I know all about babysitting for my sister. Shyla's sister Libby is in seventh grade. She's about as beautiful as Shyla. The only difference is she's bigger. My mother hesitated. I don't know, she said. I've never left Fudge before, she looked at me. Peter? What? Will you and Jimmy help Shyla watch Fudge while I run home for a minute? Oh, Mom, do we have to? Please, Peter, I'll be right back. I'll feel better if all three of you are watching him. What do you say? I asked Jimmy. Sure, he answered. Why not? But I'm in charge of Fudge, aren't I? Shyla asked my mother. Well, I guess so, my mother said to Shyla. You probably do know more about babysitting. Why don't you all take Fudge over to the playground? Then I'll know where to find you. Swell, Mrs. Hatcher, Shyla said. Don't worry, Fudgy will be just fine. My mother turned to Fudge. Now you be a good boy for ten minutes. Mommy will be right back, okay? Good boy, Fudgy said. Good, good, good. As soon as my mother was gone, Fudge took off. Can't catch me, he hollered. Can't catch Fudgy. Go get him, Shyla, I said. You're in charge, remember? Me and Jimmy horsed around while Shyla ran after Fudge. When she caught him, we decided we'd better go to the playground, like my mother said. It was a lot easier to keep an eye on him in a smaller place. Anyway, Fudge likes to climb on the jungle gym, and that way he can't get lost. As soon as we got to the playground, Shyla started chasing me. Peter's got the cooties! Peter's got the cooties! she yelled. Cut that out, I said. So she chased Jimmy. Jimmy's got the cooties! Jimmy's got the cooties! Me and Jimmy decided to fight back. So what if she's a girl? She started it. We grabbed her by the arms. She squirmed and tried to get away from us, but we wouldn't let go. We hollered really loud, Shyla's got the cooties, Shyla's got the cooties. All three of us were so busy fooling around that we didn't notice Fudge up in the jungle gym until he called, Peter, Peter. That's how he says my name. What? I asked. See, see, Fudge flapped his arms around. Fudgy is a birdie, Fudgy's a birdie, fly birdie fly. That crazy kid. I thought running to the jungle gym with Jimmy and Shyla right behind me. But it was too late. Fudge already found out he didn't have wings. He fell to the ground. He was screaming and crying and his face was a mess of blood. I couldn't even tell where the blood was coming from first. Then Jimmy handed me his handkerchief. I don't know how clean it was, but it was better than nothing. I mopped some blood off Fudge's face. Shyla cried. It wasn't my fault. Honest, it wasn't. Oh, shut up, I told her. He's really a mess, Jimmy said, inspecting Fudge. And his teeth are gone, too. What are you talking about? I asked Jimmy. Look in his mouth, Jimmy said. Now while well, he's screaming, see? He's got a big space where he used to have his front teeth. Oh, no, Shyla screamed. He's right. Fudgy's teeth are gone. Fudge stopped crying for a minute. All gone? he asked. Open your mouth wide, I said. He did, and I looked in. It was true. 
his top two front teeth were missing. "'My mother's going to kill you, Shyla," I said. Was I glad I wasn't left in charge of my brother? Shyla cried louder. But it was an accident. He did it himself. Himself. You better find his teeth, I said. Where should I look? Shyla asked. On the ground, stupid. Shyla crawled around looking for Fudge's teeth. Well, I tried to clean him up some more. See, Fudgy said, showing me all his wounds. Boo-boo here and here. More boo-boo here. His knees and elbows were all scraped up. I'm going to get your mother, Jimmy hollered, running out of the playground. Good idea, I called. I just can't find them, Shyla said. Well, keep looking, I yelled. Honestly, Peter, there aren't any teeth here. All gone, Fudgy said again. Not all, I told him, just two. Fudge started to scream. Want my teeth! Want my teeth! Jimmy must have met my mother on her way back to the park, because it only took about two minutes for her to get there. By that time, a whole crowd of kids had gathered around us. Most of them were crawling on the ground like Shyla, looking for Fudge's teeth. My mother picked up Fudge. Oh, my baby! My precious! My little love! She kissed him all over. Show Mommy where it hurts! Fudge showed her all his boo-boos. Then he said, All gone! What's all gone? my mother asked. His top two front teeth, I said. Oh no! my mother cried. Oh my poor little angel! Shyla sniffed and said, I just can't find them, Mrs. Hatcher. I've looked everywhere, but Fudge's teeth are gone. He must have swallowed them, my mother said, looking into Fudge's mouth. Oh, Mrs. Hatcher, how awful! I'm sorry, I'm really very sorry, Shyla cried. What will happen to him? He'll be all right, Shyla, my mother said. I'm sure it was an accident. Nobody's blaming you. Shyla started bawling again. My mother said, Let's go home now. I thought my mother was being pretty easy on Shyla. After all, she was left in charge. When we got home, Mom washed Fudge's cuts and scrapes with peroxide. Then she called Dr. Cohn. He told her to take Fudge to our dentist, so my mother called Dr. Brown's office and made an appointment for the next day. When that was done, she gave Fudge some socks to play with. I went into the kitchen to have a glass of juice. My mother followed me. Peter Warren Hatcher, she said. I'm sorry that I can't trust you for just ten minutes. Me? I asked. Trust me? What's this got to do with me? My mother raised her voice. I left your brother with you for ten minutes, and just look what happened. I'm disgusted with you. It was Shyla's fault, I said. You said Shyla was in charge, so how come you're mad at me and not at Shyla? I just am, my mother shouted. I ran to my room and slammed the door. I watched Dribble walk around on his favorite rock. My mother's the meanest mother in the whole world, I told my turtle. She loves Fudge more than me. She doesn't even love me anymore. She doesn't even like me. Maybe I'm not her real son. Maybe somebody left me in a basket on her doorstep. My real mother's probably a beautiful princess. I'll bet she'd like to have me back. Nobody needs me around here, that's for sure. I didn't eat much supper that night, and I had a lot of trouble falling asleep. The next morning, my mother came into my room and sat down on my bed. I didn't look at her. Peter, she said. I didn't answer. Peter, I said some things yesterday that I didn't really mean. I looked at her. Honest? I asked. Yes. You see, I was very upset over Fudge's accident, and I had to blame somebody, so I picked on you. Yes, I said, you sure did. It wasn't your fault, though. I know that. It was an accident. It could have happened even if I had been in the playground myself. He wanted to fly, I said. He thought he was a bird. 
I don't think he'll try to fly again, my mother said. Me neither, I told her. Then we both laughed, and I knew she was my real mother after all. Chapter 5 The Birthday Bash I got used to the way Fudge looked without his top front teeth. He looked like a very small first grader. Dr. Brown, our dentist, said he'd have to wait until he was six or seven to get his grown-up teeth. I started calling him Fang because when he smiled, all you can see are the top two side teeth next to the big space. So it looks like he has fangs. My mother didn't like that. I want you to stop calling him Fang, she told me. What should I call him? I asked. Farley Drexel? Just plain fudge will be fine, my mother said. What's wrong with Farley Drexel? I asked. How come you named him that if you don't like it? I like it fine, my mother said. But right now we call him Fudge, not Farley, not Drexel, and not Fang. What's wrong with Fang? I asked. I think it sounds neat. Fang is an insult. Oh, come on, Mom. He doesn't even know what a fang is. But I know, Peter, and I don't like it. Okay, okay. I promise never to call my brother Fang again. But secretly, whenever I look at him, I think it. My brother, Fang Hatcher. Nobody can stop me from thinking. My mind is my own. Fudge is going to be three years old. My mother said he should have a birthday party with some of his friends. He plays with three other little kids who live in our building. There's Jenny, Ralph, and Sam. My mother invited them to Fudge's party. Grandma said she'd come over to help. My father couldn't make it. He had a Saturday business appointment. I wanted to go to Jimmy Fargo's, but my mother said she needed me to supervise the games. The kids were invited from 1 until 2.30. That's only an hour and a half, my mother reminded me. That's not so bad, is it, Peter? I don't know yet, I told her. Ask me later. The kitchen table was set up for the party. The cloth and napkins and paper plates and cups all matched. They had pictures of Superman on them. Right before party time, Grandma tried to change Fudge into his new suit. But he screamed his head off about it. No suit! No suit! No, no, no! My mother tried to reason with him. It's your birthday, Fudgy. All your friends are coming. You want to look like a big boy, don't you? While she was talking to him, she managed to get him into his shirt and pants. But he wouldn't let her put on his shoes. He kicked and carried on until my mother and grandmother were both black and blue. Finally, they decided as long as he was in his suit, his feet didn't matter. So he wore his old bedroom slippers. Ralph arrived first. He's really fat, and he isn't even four years old. He doesn't say much either. He grunts and grabs a lot, though. Usually his mouth is stuffed full of something. So the first thing Ralph did was wander into the kitchen. He looked around for something to eat, but Grandma was guarding the place. She kept telling him, No, no, must wait until the other children come. Jenny arrived next. She was wearing little white gloves and party shoes. She even carried a pocketbook. Besides that, she had on dirty jeans and an old sweater. Her mother apologized for her clothes but said she couldn't do anything with Jenny lately, especially since she had taken to biting. What does she bite, I asked, thinking about the furniture or toys or stuff like that. She bites people, Jenny's mother said, but you don't have to worry about it unless her teeth go through the skin. Otherwise, it's perfectly safe. I thought, poor old fudge. He can't even bite back since he hasn't got any top front teeth. I looked at Jenny. She seemed so innocent. It was hard to believe she was a vampire. Sam came last. He carried a big present for Fudge, but he was crying. It's just a stage he's going through, his mother explained. 
Everything scares him, especially birthday parties. But he'll be fine, won't you, Sam? Sam grabbed onto his mother's leg and screamed, Take me home! Take me home! Somehow, Sam's mother untangled herself from Sam's grip and left. So at five after one, we were ready to begin. We had an eater, a biter, and a crier. I thought that 2.30 would never come. I also thought my mother was slightly crazy for dreaming up the party in the first place. Doesn't Fudge have any normal friends, I whispered. There's nothing wrong with Fudgy's friends, my mother whispered back. All small children are like that. Grandma got them seated around the kitchen table. She put a party hat on each kid's head. Sam screamed, Get it off! Get it off! But the others wore their hats and didn't complain. My mother snapped a picture of them with her new camera. Then Grandma turned off the lights and my mother lit the candles on Fudge's cake. It had chocolate frosting and big yellow roses. I led the singing of Happy Birthday. My mother carried the cake across the kitchen to the party table and set it down in front of Fudge. Sam cried, Too dark! Too dark! So Grandma had to turn on the kitchen lights before Fudge blew out his candles. When he was finished blowing, he reached out and grabbed a rose off his cake. He shoved it into his mouth. Oh, Fudge, my mother said, look what you did. But Grandma said, it's his birthday. He can do whatever he wants. So Fudge reached over and grabbed a second rose. I guess Fat Ralph couldn't stand seeing Fudge eat those yellow roses because he grabbed one too. By that time, the cake looked pretty messy. My mother, finally coming to her senses, took the cake away and sliced it up. Each kid got a Dixie cup, a small piece of cake, and some milk. But Jenny hollered, Where's my rose? Want one too? Because her slice of birthday cake didn't happen to have one. My mother explained that the roses were only decorations and that there weren't enough to go around. Jenny seemed to accept that. But when Grandma stood over her to help her open her Dixie, Jenny bit her on the hand. She bit me, Grandma cried. Did it break the skin, my mother asked. No, I don't think so, Grandma said, checking. Good, then it's nothing to worry about, my mother told her. Grandma went into the bathroom to put some medicine on it anyway. She wasn't taking any chances. Ralph was the first one to finish his food. More! More, more, he sang, holding up his empty plate. I don't think you should give him any more, I whispered to my mother. Look how fat he is now. Oh, Peter, this is a party. Let him eat whatever he wants. Okay, I said. Why should I care how fat he gets? My mother served Ralph a second piece of cake. He threw up right after he finished it. Me and Grandma took the kids into the living room while my mother cleaned up the mess. Grandma told Fudge he could open his presents while his friends watched. Jenny brought him a musical jack-in-the-box. When you turn the handle around, it plays Pop Goes the Weasel. When you reach the part of the song about Pop, the top opens and a funny clown jumps up. Fudge loved it. He clapped his hands and laughed and laughed, but Sam started to scream. No, no more. Take it away. He hid his face in his hands and wouldn't look up until Grandma promised to put the jack-in-the-box in another room. Fudge opened Ralph's present next. It was a little wind-up car that ran all over the floor. I kind of liked it myself. So did Ralph, because he grabbed it away from Fudge and said, Mine! No, Fudge shouted, Mine! When my mother heard the racket, she ran in from the kitchen. She explained to Ralph that he had brought the car to Fudge because it was his birthday. But Ralph wouldn't listen. I guess my mother was afraid he might throw up again, and this time on the living room rug. So she begged Fudge to let Ralph play with the car for a few minutes. But Ralph kept screaming that it was his car, so Fudge started to cry. Finally, my mother took the car away and said, Let's see what Sam brought you. Fudge liked that idea. He forgot about the little car as he ripped the paper and ribbon off Sam's package. 
it turned out to be a big picture dictionary the same kind the yarbies brought me a couple of months ago fudge got mad when he saw it no he yelled no more books he threw it across the room fudge that's terrible my mother said you mustn't do that to the nice book no book fudge said sam cried he doesn't like it he doesn't like my present i want to go home i want to go home grandma tried to comfort sam while my mother picked up the book she gathered the wrapping paper and ribbons and cards together fudge didn't even look at any of the birthday cards oh well he can't read so i guess it doesn't make a difference peter my mother said let's start the games now quick i checked the time i hoped the party was almost over but no it was only one thirty still an hour to go i went into my room where i had blown up a lot of balloons my mother had a party book and it said three-year-olds like to dance around with balloons when i got back to the living room mom started the record player and i handed each kid a balloon but they just stood there looking at me i thought either the guy who wrote that party book is crazy or i am show them how peter my mother said take a balloon and demonstrate i felt like one of the world's greatest living fools dancing around with a balloon but it worked as soon as the kids saw me doing it they started dancing too jenny's balloon popped that nearly scared sam right out of his mind he started yelling and crying fortunately i had blown up two dozen balloons i was hoping they'd dance around the rest of the afternoon fudge got the idea of jumping up and down on the furniture the others liked that too so instead of dancing with their balloons that's what they did and soon they were running from room to room yelling and laughing and having a great time then the doorbell rang it was mrs rudder she lives in the apartment right under us she wanted to know what was going on she said it sounded like her ceiling was about to crash in on her any second my mother explained that fudge was having a little birthday party and wouldn't she like to stay for a piece of cake sometimes my mother is really clever so grandma entertained mrs rudder in the kitchen while fudge and his buddies jumped up and down on his new bed it was delivered this morning fudge hasn't even slept in it yet so naturally when my mother found out what they were up to she was mad stop right now she said new bed big boy fudge told her was he proud you won't have a new big boy bed for long if you don't stop jumping on it my mother told him i know let's all sit down on the floor and hear a nice story my mother selected a picture book from fudge's bookshelf i heard that one said jenny when she saw the cover all right my mother told her let's hear this one she held up another book i heard that one too jenny said i think my mother was starting to lose her patience but she chose a third book and said we'll all enjoy this one even if we know it by heart and if we do know it by heart well we can say it together that's just what jenny did and when my mother skipped a page by mistake jenny was right there to remind her if you ask me my mother felt like biting jenny by that time when the story was over it was two o'clock and ralph was sound asleep on the floor my mother told me to put him up on fudge's new bed while she took the rest of the children back to the living room i tried and tried but i couldn't lift ralph he must weigh a ton so i left him sleeping on fudge's floor and closed the door so he couldn't hear any noise on my way back to the living room i wished the others would fall asleep too peter my mother suggested why don't you show them dribble mom dribbles my pet you don't go around using a pet to entertain a bunch of little kids didn't my mother know that please peter my mother said we've still got half an hour left and i don't know what to do with them any more dribble fudge hollered dribble 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 
I guess Sam and Jenny liked the way that sounded because they started to shout, Dribble! 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 Even though they didn't know what they were talking about. Oh, all right, I said. I'll show you dribble. But you've got to promise to be very quiet. You mustn't make a sound. You might scare him, okay? They all said, okay. My mother went into the kitchen to chat with Grandma and Mrs. Rudder. I went into my room and came back carrying dribble in his bowl. I put my finger over my lip to remind Fudge and his friends to be quiet. It worked. At first, nobody said a word. I put Dribble down on the table. Fudge and Sam and Jenny stood over his bowl. Oh, turtle, Jenny said. Yes, Dribble's a turtle. My turtle, I said in a soft voice. See, see, Fudge whispered. They can all see, I told Fudge. Nice turtle, Sam said. I wondered why he wasn't afraid this time. What does Dribble do? Jenny asked. Do? He doesn't do anything special, I said. He's a turtle. He does turtle things. Like what? Jenny asked. What was with this kid anyway? Well, I said, he swims around a little and he sleeps on his rock and he eats. Does he make? Jenny asked. Make? I said. Make a tinkle. Oh, that. Well, sure, I guess so. Jenny laughed. So did Sam and Fudge. I make tinkles too. Wanna see? Jenny asked. No, I said. See, see, Fudge laughed, pointing at Jenny. Jenny had a big smile on her face. Next thing I knew, there was a puddle on the rug. Mom, I hollered, come quick. My mother dashed in from the kitchen. What, Peter, what is it? Just look at what Jenny did, I said. What is that? My mother asked, eyeing the puddle. She made on the floor, I said, and on purpose. Oh, Jenny, my mother cried, you didn't. Did too, Jenny said. That was very naughty, my mother told her. You come with me. She scooped up Jenny and carried her into the bathroom. After that, mother mopped up the puddle. Finally, the doorbell rang. It was 2.30. The party was over. I could hardly believe it. I was beginning to think it would never end. First, Ralph's mother came. She had to wake him up to get him out of the apartment. I guess even she couldn't carry him. Next, Jenny's mother came. Mom gave her Jenny's wet pants in a baggie. That was all she had to do. Jenny's mother was plenty embarrassed. Sam's mother came last, and he didn't want to go home. Now that he was used to us, I guess he liked us. He cried, more party, more. Another time, his mother said, dragging him out of our apartment by the arm. My mother flopped down in a chair. Grandma brought her two aspirins and a glass of water. Here, dear, she said, maybe these will help. My mother swallowed the pills. She held her head. Three is kind of young for a party, I told my mother. Peter Warren Hatcher, my mother began. Yes, I asked. You are absolutely right. I flopped down next to my mother. She put her arms around me. Then we both watched Fudge work his new jack-in-the-box. Later, when my father came home, he said, How did Fudge's party go? My mother and I looked at each other, and we laughed. Chapter 6. Fang Hits Town Fudge liked his new bed a lot. There was just one problem. He fell out of it every night. By the fourth night, my mother and father got smart. They pushed the bed against the wall and surrounded the other side with chairs. Now there was no place for Fudge to fall. But every morning, my mother found him curled up in one of the chairs. My father said they could have saved their money since Fudge was so happy sleeping on an old chair. On Saturday, we had to go to the dentist. He wanted to check Fudge's mouth again to make sure everything healed all right since his flying experience. Dr. Brown is an old friend of my father's. They went to school together. He's always saying he takes special good care of me and Fudge because we're chips off the old block. The old block being my father. His office is on the other side of the park. It's near Madison Avenue.
My mother said we'd make a day of it, and wouldn't that be fun? I'd rather go to the movies with Jimmy Fargo, I told her. But we'll have such a good time, my mother said. The three of us will go out for lunch, and then we'll get new shoes for you and Fudge. I've been out to lunch with Fudge, I reminded her. He's growing up, Peter. He knows how to behave now. I'd still rather go to the movies with Jimmy. Well, you're coming with me, and that's that. I wasn't looking forward to my day, and Saturday morning is always the best day of the week. Every Saturday morning, I clean out Dribble's bowl. Sometimes, if Fudge is very good, I let him watch, but I do it in the bathroom. First, I take Dribble out of his bowl and let him crawl around in the tub. I'm afraid to put him down on the floor. Somebody might step on him, but the tub I know is safe. Next, I take the rocks out of the bowl and wash them. The last thing I do is wash the bowl itself. I really scrub it. I even rinse it two or three times to make sure all the soap is out. When I'm done with that, I put the rocks back in and fill it with just the right amount of water. After I put Dribble back in his bowl, I feed him. Usually he goes right to sleep on his favorite rock. I guess running around in the bathtub really makes my turtle tired. Today I finished with Dribble just in time. My mother was rushing, mumbling about getting us to Dr. Brown's office in time for our appointment. When we were outside, we took the Crosstown bus, then walked a few blocks to his office. As soon as the nurse saw Fudge, she said, How's my favorite patient? She gave him a hug and a little book to read. To me, she said, Good morning, Peter. It burns me up the way people treat Fudge. He's not so special. He's just little, that's all. But some day he's going to be nine years old, too. I can't wait until he is. Then he'll know there's nothing so great about him after all. Soon the nurse said, Fudge, Dr. Brown is ready for you. Come with me now. Fudge took the nurse's hand. Dr. Brown has this rule about mothers in the examining room, with kids. They're not allowed. Mothers are a big problem. Dr. Brown told me once. I agree. I looked through a National Geographic magazine while I waited. After a few minutes, the nurse came out and whispered something to my mother. I looked up, wondering what the big secret was. Then my mother said, Peter, Dr. Brown would like you to help him with fudge. Help him, I said. I'm no dentist. The nurse said, Peter, dear, if you'll just come with me, I'm sure everything will work out fine. So I went with the nurse. What do I have to do, I asked her. Oh, not much. Dr. Brown just wants you to show Fudge how you open your mouth and how he checks your teeth. What do I have to do that for? I asked. I don't need a checkup yet. I just had one last month. Your brother won't open his mouth this morning, the nurse whispered. He won't? I whispered back. No, he won't, she said again. I thought that was pretty funny. I never considered refusing to open my mouth at the dentist's office. When he says, open, I open. When we reached the examining room, Fudge was sitting in the big chair. He had a towel around his neck, and he looked all ready for action. Dr. Brown was showing him lots of little things and explaining what he does with each one. Fudge kept nodding, but he wouldn't open his mouth. Ah, Peter, Dr. Brown said when he saw me. Would you open your mouth so I can count your teeth? That's what he tells little kids he's doing, counting their teeth. Little kids will believe anything. I went along with Dr. Brown's joke. I opened my mouth very wide, much wider than when I'm the real patient. He put his mirror in and said, Wonderful teeth, just beautiful, a regular chip off the old block. Such a shame your brother can't open his mouth the way you do. Can do, Fudge said. No, Dr. Brown told him. You can't open your mouth nearly as good as Peter. Can so, see? Fudge opened his mouth. No, I'm sorry, Fudge, Dr. Brown said. It's still not as good as Peter. So Fudge opened his mouth really wide. Count teeth, he said. Count Fudgy's teeth. 
Well, Dr. Brown pretended to think about it. Count, Fudge shouted. Well, Dr. Brown said again, scratching his head, I guess as long as you're here, I might as well count your teeth. So he checked Fudge's mouth. When he was through, Fudge said, See, see, just like PETA. Yes, Dr. Brown said, smiling, I can see that. You're just like Peter. He gave me a wink. I liked the way Dr. Brown tricked Fudge into opening his mouth. So when he was through examining him, I whispered, Couldn't you make Fudge some false teeth until his grown-up ones come in? No, he'll just have to wait, Dr. Brown said. But he looks like he has fangs, I told him. You'd better not say that in front of your mother, Dr. Brown said. I know it. She's not too big on fangs. Dr. Brown thanked me for helping him. My mother made another appointment for Fudge. The nurse kissed my brother goodbye, and we left. That wasn't so bad, was it, Peter? My mother said. It could have been worse, I admitted. We headed for Bloomingdale's, where we get our shoes. There are five salesmen in the children's shoe department. One of them my mother doesn't like. She thinks they don't measure my feet carefully. That all they care about is selling shoes, even if they don't have the right sizes in stock. The other ones my mother thinks are okay. There's one she likes a lot. His name is Mr. Berman. I like him too because he's funny. He usually makes believe that the right shoe goes on the left foot, or that Fudge's shoes are really for me. Anyway... When Mr. Berman waits on us, buying shoes is almost fun. Today, Mr. Berman spotted us right away. He always remembers our name. Well, if it isn't the Hatcher boys, he said. In the flesh, I told him. Fudge opened his mouth for Mr. Berman. See, see, all gone. His teeth, my mother explained to Mr. Berman. He knocked out his top two front teeth. Well, congratulations, Mr. Berman said. That calls for a celebration. He reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out two lollipops. He handed one to me and the other one to Fudge. Oh, Fudge said, lolly. Mine was root beer flavored. I hate root beer, but I thanked Mr. Berman anyway. I'll save it for after lunch, I told him. Handing it to my mother, she put it into her purse. Fudge got a lemon lolly. He ripped off the paper and started sucking right away. Now then, what'll it be, boys? Mr. Berman asked. My mother answered, brown and white sandals for Fudge and loafers for Peter. Okay, Peter, let's see how those feet have grown. I slipped out of my old shoes and stood up. I stuck my left foot into Mr. Berman's foot measure. Then he turned it around and I put my right foot in. That's another reason why my mother thinks Mr. Berman is good at selling shoes. He measures both feet. Some other salesmen only measure one. My mother says feet can be different sizes, even on the same person, and it's important to make sure the size fits the biggest foot. What color loafers, Peter? Mr. Berman asked. Brown, I said, same as my old ones. When Mr. Berman went into the back to look for shoes for me, my mother noticed a hole in the toe of my sock. Oh, Peter, why didn't you tell me you had a hole in your sock? I didn't know I had one, I said. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. It's my sock, Mom. Why should you be embarrassed, I asked. Well, it looks terrible. I mean to come shopping for shoes with a hole in your sock. That's just awful. Can't you hide it a little? Where should I hide it? Try to get the hole in between your toes so it doesn't show, my mother said. I wiggled my sock around trying to rearrange my hole. My mother sure worries about silly things. Mr. Berman came out with two pairs of loafers. He likes to try different sizes to make sure I'm getting the right one. One pair was much too big. The other pair fit fine. Wear or wrap, Mr. Berman asked my mother. Wrap, please, she said. We'll wear the old ones home. I have never been allowed to wear the new shoes home from the store. Don't ask me why, but my mother always has the new pair wrapped up, and I can't wear them until the next day. When I was finished, Mr. Berman untied Fudge's shoes and measured his feet. Brown and white saddle shoes, my mother reminded him. Mr. Berman went into the back and returned with two shoe boxes. 
but when he opened the first box and fudge saw the saddle shoes he said no no what my mother asked him no shoes fudge said he started kicking his feet don't be silly fudgy you need new shoes my mother told him no 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 he hollered everybody in the shoe department looked over at us here's the perfect size mr berman told fudge holding up one shoe wait till you see how nice these new shoes will feel fudge kicked some more it was impossible for mr berman to get the shoes on his feet he screamed no shoes no 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 my mother grabbed hold of him but he was wiggling all around he managed to give mr berman a kick in the face lucky for him fudge only had on socks now look fudge my mother said you must get new shoes the old ones are too small so what kind do you want i don't know why my mother bothered to talk to him like he was a regular person because when fudge gets himself into a temper tantrum he doesn't listen to anything by that time he had thrown himself onto the floor where he beat his fists against the rug what kind do you want fudge because we're not leaving here until you have new shoes my mother said like she meant it i figured we'd be there for the rest of the day or maybe the week how could my mother have been embarrassed over a little hole in my sock and then act like nothing much was happening when her other son was on the floor yelling and screaming and carrying on i'm going to count to three my mother told fudge and then i want you to tell me which shoes you want ready one two three fudge sat up like peter's he said i smiled i guess the kid really looks up to me he even wants to wear the same kind of shoes but everybody knows you can't buy loafers for such a little guy they don't come in your size mr berman told fudge yes 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 like peter's fudge hollered mr berman held up his hands and looked at my mother as if to say i give up but my mother said i have an idea she motioned for me and mr berman to come closer i had the feeling i wasn't going to like her idea but i listened anyway i think we'll have to play a little joke on fudge she said what do you mean i asked well suppose mr berman brings out a pair of saddle shoes in your size and oh no i said you're not going to get me to wear saddle shoes never let me finish my mother said mr berman can bring them out and you can try them on and then fudge will think that's what you're getting but when we leave we'll take the loafers that's mean i said you're taking advantage of him since when do you worry about that my mother asked since now i told her look peter my mother said checking her watch it's twelve o'clock i'm starved me too i said well then if you ever want to get some lunch let's try my idea okay okay i said i sat back in my chair while mr berman hurried to the stockroom again fudge looked up at me from his position on the floor like peter's he said yeah sure fudge i told him mr berman came back with a pair of brown and white saddle shoes in my size i tried them on did they look ugly see peter's nice saddle shoes my mother said now fudgy tries on his nice saddle shoes fudge let mr berman get him into his new pair of shoes see he said see like peter's he held up a foot that's right fudgy i said just like mine you sure can fool little kids easy where or rap mr berman asked my mother while fudge walked around in his new shoes rap of course she said i wondered what my mother would tell fudge tomorrow when i wore my new loafers oh well that really wasn't my worry it was her idea when fudge was back in his old shoes and our package was ready mr berman gave my brother a striped balloon he offered one to me too i refused how could he think a person in fourth grade might want a shoe store balloon that wasn't so terrible was it peter my mother said as we left the store it wasn't i asked well it could have been worse my mother said i suppose i answered we went to hamburger heaven for lunch we sat in a booth 
Fudge tossed his balloons around while my mother ordered for him, and then for herself. I ordered my own lunch, a hamburger with everything on it, and a chocolate milkshake. Fudge was getting a kitty special, meaning a hamburger without the roll, some mashed potatoes and a side order of green peas. When our lunch was served, my mother cut Fudge's hamburger into tiny little pieces, which he shoved into his mouth with his fingers. Then she handed him a spoon and told him to eat his mashed potatoes. But instead of eating them, he smeared them on the wall. See, he said. I thought you told me he wouldn't behave like that any more, I said to my mother. Fudgy, that's naughty. You stop it right now, my mother said. But Fudge sang, eat it or wear it, and he dumped the whole dish of peas over his head. I laughed. I couldn't help it. He looked so silly with the peas falling from his hair. And when I eat and laugh at the same time, I choke. So I choked on my pickle, and my mother had to whack me on the back, which gave Fudge another chance to spread mashed potatoes on the wall. That's when the waitress asked my mother, did we want anything else? No, thank you, my mother said. We have more than enough now. She wiped off the wall with her napkin and told Fudge he was very, very naughty. Not me, Fudge said, not me. Yes, you, my mother told him. Why can't you eat like Peter? See how nice Peter eats? Fudge didn't say anything. He just stuck his fork into his balloon. It popped and he screamed, All gone! Want more balloon? More! Shut up, I told him. Can't you ever act human? That's enough, Peter, my mother said. She should have slugged him. That would teach that brother of mine how to behave in hamburger heaven. We took a cab home. Fudge fell asleep on the way. He had his fingers in his mouth and made his slurping noise. My mother whispered to me, Our day wasn't that bad, was it, Peter? I didn't answer. I just looked out the taxi window and decided that I would never spend a day with Farley Drexel Hatcher again. Chapter 7 The Flying Train Committee In January, our class started a project on the city. Mrs. Haver, our teacher, divided us up into committees by where we live. That way we could work at home. My committee was me, Jimmy Fargo, and Shyla. Our topic was transportation. We decided to make my apartment the meeting place because I'm the only one of the three of us who's got his own bedroom. In a few weeks, each committee had to hand in a booklet or a poster and be ready to give an oral report. The first day we got together after school, we bought a yellow poster board. Jimmy wanted a blue one, but Shyla talked him out of it. Yellow is a much brighter color, she explained. Everything will show up on it. Blue is too dull. Shyla thinks she's smarter than me and Jimmy, put together, just because she's a girl. So right away she told us she would be in charge of our booklet, and me and Jimmy could do most of the poster, as long as we check with her first to make sure she likes our ideas. We agreed, since Shyla promised to do ten pages of written work, and we would only do five. After we bought the yellow poster board, we went to the library. We took out seven books on transportation. We wanted to learn all we could about speed, traffic congestion, and pollution. We arranged to meet on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons for the next two weeks. Our first few committee meetings turned out like this. We got to my place by 3.30, had a snack, then played with Dribble for half an hour. Shyla gave up on cooties when Fudge lost his front teeth. But it still isn't much fun to have her hanging around. She's always complaining that she got stuck with the worst possible committee, oh, and that me and Jimmy fool more than we work. We only put up with her because we have no choice. Shyla and Jimmy have to be home for supper before 5.30, so at 5 o'clock we start cleaning up. We keep our equipment under my bed in a shoebox. We have a set of magic markers, Elmer's glue, scotch tape, and a really sharp pair of scissors, and a container of silver sparkle. Shyla carries our committee booklet back and forth with her. She doesn't trust us enough to leave it at my house. 
The poster board fits under my bed, along with our supplies. We stack the library books on my desk. The reason I make sure we clean up good is that my mother told me if I left a mess, we'd have to find some place else to work. By our third meeting, I told Jimmy and Shyla that I'd figured out the solution to New York City's traffic problems. We have to get rid of the traffic, I said. There shouldn't be any cars or buses or taxis allowed in the city. What we really need is a city-wide monorail system. That's too expensive, Shyla said. It sounds good, but it's not practical. I disagree, I told Shyla. It's very practical. Besides, getting rid of traffic, it'll get rid of air pollution, and it'll get people where they're going a lot faster. But it's not practical, Peter. Shyla said again. It costs too much. I opened one of my books on transportation and read Shyla a quote. A monorail system is the hope of the future. I cleared my throat and looked up. But we can't write a report just about the monorail, Shyla said. We'll never be able to fill twenty written pages on that. We can write big, Jimmy suggested. No, Shyla said. I want a good mark on this project. Peter, you can write your five pages about the monorail system and how it works. Jimmy, you can write your five pages about pollution caused by transportation, and I'll write my ten pages on the history of transportation in the city. Shyla folded her arms and smiled. Can I write big? Jimmy asked. I don't care how big you write as long as you put your name on your five pages. Shyla told him. That's not fair, Jimmy said. This is supposed to be a group project. Why should I have to put my name on my five pages? Then don't write big, Shyla shouted. Okay, okay, I'll write so small. Mrs. Haver will need a microscope to see the letters. Very funny, Shyla said. Look, I told both of them, I think all our written work should be in the same handwriting. That's the only fair way. Otherwise, Mrs. Haver will know who did what. And it won't be a group project. Say that's a good idea, Jimmy said. Which one of us has the best handwriting? Me and Jimmy looked at Shyla. Well, I do have a nice even script, Shyla said. But if I'm going to copy over your written work, you better give it to me by Tuesday. Otherwise, I won't have enough time to do the job. And you two better get going on your poster. Shyla talked like she was the teacher, and we were the kids. Me and Jimmy designed the whole poster ourselves. We used the pros and cons of each kind of transportation. It was really clever. We divided a chart into land, sea, and air, and we planned an illustration for each, with the airplane done in silver sparkle and the letters done in red and blue magic marker. We got halfway through the lettering that day. We also sketched the ship, the plane, and the truck. When Shyla saw it, she asked. Is that supposed to be a train? No, I told her it's a truck. It doesn't look like one, she said. It will, Jimmy told her, when it's finished. I hope so, Shyla said, because right now it looks like a flying train. That's because the ground's not under it yet, Jimmy said. Yeah, I agreed. See, we've got to make it look like it's on a street. Right now, it does kind of look like it's up in space. So does the ship, Shyla said. We'll put some water lines around it. I told her, and some clouds around the plane. Shyla said, "Listen, Jimmy hollered. Did anybody ever tell you you're too bossy? This poster is ours. You do the booklet. Remember, that's the way you wanted it. See, there you go again." Shyla said. "You keep forgetting this is a committee. We're supposed to work together." Working together doesn't mean you give the orders and we carry them out," Jimmy said. "My feelings exactly," I thought. Shyla didn't answer Jimmy. She picked up her things, got her coat, and left. "I hope she never comes back," Jimmy said. "She'll be back," I told him. "We're her committee." Jimmy laughed. "Yeah, we're all one happy committee." I put our poster under the bed, said goodbye to Jimmy, then washed up for supper. My mother was being pretty nice about our committee meetings. She arranged to have fudge play at Ralph's apartment on Tuesdays and at Jenny's on Thursdays. Sam has the chicken pox, so he can't play at all. 
I was glad that next week would be our last committee meeting after school. I was sick of Shyla, and I was getting sick of transportation. Besides, now that I knew a monorail system was the only way to save our city, I was getting upset that the mayor and all the other guys that run things at City Hall weren't doing anything about installing one. If I know that's the best method of city transportation, how come they don't know it? The next day, when I came home from school, I went to my bedroom to see Dribble, like I always do. Fudge was in there, sitting on my bed. Why are you in my room? I asked him. He smiled. You know you're not supposed to be in here. This is my room. Want to see? Fudge said. See what? Want to see? What? What are you talking about? I asked. He jumped off my bed and crawled underneath it. He came out with our poster. He held it up. See, he said, pretty. What did you do, I yelled. What did you do to our poster? It was covered all over with scribbles in every color magic marker. It was ruined. It was a mess, and it was ruined. I was ready to kill Fudge. I grabbed my poster and ran into the kitchen to show it to my mother. I could hardly speak. Look, I said, feeling a lump in my throat. Just look at what he did to my poster. I felt tears come to my eyes, but I didn't care. How could you let him? I asked my mother. How? Don't you care about me? I threw the poster down and ran into my room. I slammed the door and took off my shoe and flung it at the wall. It made a black mark where it hit. Well, so what? I heard my mother hollering. And then Fudge crying. After a while, my mother knocked on my bedroom door and called, Peter, may I come in? I didn't answer. She opened the door and walked over to my bed. She sat down next to me. I'm very sorry, she said. I still didn't say anything. Peter, she began. I didn't look at her. She touched my arm. Peter, please listen. Don't you see, Mom? I can't ever do my homework without him messing it up. It just isn't fair. I wish he was never born. Never. I hate him. You don't hate him, my mother said. You just think you do. Don't tell me, I said. I mean it. I really can't stand that kid. You're angry, my mother told me. I know that. And I don't blame you. Fudge had no right to touch your poster. I spanked him. You did? I asked. Fudge never gets spanked. My parents don't believe in spanking. You really spanked him? I asked again. Yes, my mother said. Hard? I asked. On his backside, she told me. I thought it over. Peter, my mother put her arms around me. I'll buy you a new poster board tomorrow. It was really my fault. I should never have let him into your room. That's why I need a lock on my door, I said. I don't like locks on doors. We're a family. We don't have to lock each other out. If I had a lock, Fudge wouldn't have gotten my poster. It won't happen again, my mother promised. I wanted to believe her, but really I didn't. Unless she tied him up, I knew my brother would get into my room again. The next day, while I was at school... My mother bought a new yellow poster board. The hard part was explaining to Jimmy that we had to start all over again. He was a good sport about it. He said this time he'd make sure his truck didn't look like a flying train. And I said this time I'd make pencil marks first so my letters didn't go uphill. Our committee met that afternoon. Shyla didn't mention the last time. Neither did we. Me and Jimmy worked on the poster while Shyla copied our written work into the booklet. We'd be ready to give our oral report to the class on Monday, not like some committees who hadn't even started yet. By five o'clock we had finished our poster, and Shyla was almost done with the cover for our booklet. Jimmy walked over and stood behind her watching her work. After a minute he yelled, What do you think you're doing, Shyla? I got up from the floor and joined them at my desk. I took a look at the cover. It was pretty nice. It said, Transportation in the City. Under that, it said, By Shyla Tubman, Peter Hatcher, and James Fargo. 
and under that, in small letters, it said, Handwritten by Miss Shyla Tubman. Now I knew why Jimmy was mad. Oh, no, I said, holding my hand to my head. How could you? Shyla didn't say anything. It's not fair, I told her. We didn't put our names on the poster. But the cover's all done, Shyla said. Can't you see that? I'll never get the letters so straight again. It looks perfect. Oh, no, Jimmy shouted. We're not handing the booklet in like that. I'll rip it up before I let you. He grabbed the booklet and threatened to tear it in half. Shyla screamed, You wouldn't. I'll kill you. Give it back to me, Jimmy Fargo. She was ready to cry. I knew Jimmy wouldn't tear it up, but I didn't say so. Peter, make him give it back. Will you take off that line about your handwriting? I asked. I can't. It'll ruin the booklet. Then I think he should rip it up, I said. Shyla stamped her foot. Ooh, I hate you both. You don't really, I told her. You just think you do. I know I do, Shyla cried. That's because you're angry right now, I said. I couldn't help smiling. Shyla jumped up and tried to get the booklet, but Jimmy held it over his head, and he's much taller than Shyla. She had no chance at all. Finally, she sat down and whispered, I give up. You win. I'll take my name off. You promise? Jimmy asked. I promise, Shyla said. Jimmy set the booklet down on my desk in front of Shyla. Okay, he said. Start. I'm not going to make a whole new cover, Shyla said. What I'll do is turn this bottom line into a decoration. She picked up the magic marker and made little flowers out of the words. Soon, handwritten by Miss Shyla Tubman, turned into sixteen small flowers. There, Shyla said, it's done. It looks pretty good, I told her. It would have looked better without those flowers, Jimmy said, but at least it's fair now. That night I showed my mother and father our new poster. They thought it was great, especially our silver sparkle airplane. My mother put the poster on the top of the refrigerator so it would be safe until the next day when I would take it to school. Now I had nothing to worry about. Shyla had the booklet, the poster was safe, and our committee was finished before schedule. I went into my room to relax. Fudge was sitting on the floor near my bed. My shoe box of supplies was in front of him. His face was a mess of magic marker colors, and he was using my extra sharp scissors to snip away at his hair. And the hair he snipped was dropping into Dribble's bowl, which he had in front of him on the floor. See, he said, see Fudge. Fudgy's a barber. That night I found out hair doesn't hurt my turtle. I picked off every strand from his shell. I cleaned out his bowl and washed off his rocks. He seemed happy. Two things happened the next day. One was my mother had to take Fudge to the real barber to do something about his hair. He had plenty left in the back, but just about nothing in front and on top. The barber said there wasn't much he could do until his hair grew back. Between his fangs and his hair, he was getting funnier looking every day. The second was my father came home with a chain latch for my bedroom door. I could reach it when I stood on tiptoe, but that brother of mine couldn't reach it at all, no matter what. Our committee was the first to give its report. Mrs. Haver said we did a super job. She liked our poster a lot. She thought the Silver Sparkle airplane was the best. The only thing she asked us was how come we included a picture of a flying train.